All right, we're going to talk about two artworks for Art in New Spain. Number 90 is called Angel with Archibus, Aziel Timor D. That's the name of the piece. Um, it's by the Master of Calamarca, but I don't think we need to remember all of that. 17th century, and we do need to know this is oil on canvas. Again, this is the standard of European painting, and this is um, an example of what painting is being created with in Spain, which is why we are seeing it in Peru. That's where this painting is happening. So that's influence from European art. All right, so what those words mean, Aziel Timor D is the name of the angel. The word Aziel means angel. And then Harkibus, also spelled Archibus, is also called a hackbutt, which is the first gun fired from the shoulder, a smooth bore matchlock with a stock resembling that of a rifle. What we need to know is the harquebus was invented in Spain in the mid 15th century. It was often fired from a support against which the recoil was transferred from a hook on the gun. But this is a gun invented in Spain that is now being brought into Central America. Here's an excerpt from the Khan Academy about this. Firearms did not exist in the Americas before the Spanish conquests. And there is evidence suggesting indigenous people saw guns as supernatural manifestations. All right, so context. These paintings are made in the vice royalty of Peru and was widespread throughout the Andes. And that's where I'm talking about. The vice royalty used to control all of South America. And the workshop of the artist created a series of angels with guns. So this is not the only one. I think I gave you some different examples on your note page as well. And then the artist is right over here from Bolivia. All right, so make some observations looking at the other examples that you have. What can you tell just by looking at them? All right, so some clues that we get from looking at them. Um, the clothing is of Andean aristocrats and Inca royalty. That's what their clothes represent. Uh, aristocrats just means upper class, wealthy people. This is a very fashion forward, European inspired attire. <laughs> so the clothing is being inspired from European fashion, having those plumed uh, feathered hats. And we associate this excess of fabric with wealth, which we saw in the Arnolfini portrait, having the fur, the fur trimmed coat, having all of this um, billowing out of fabric, excess of fabric equals wealth. Okay, here's a quote. A priest in Peru described the second coming of Christ as an event when an army of well-attired angel, angels with feathered hats would ascend from the heavens. So that's exactly what we're seeing in these prints. And by the way, his, his wing is back here, and then he has another one kind of, you know, darker in the back. When I first saw this, I did not see the wings. All right, so the function of these paintings, remember there's more than one. These are used in a missionary effort to end the pre-Hispanic religions, so to end the indigenous religions that are in Peru, and enforce Catholicism with this army of angels. Content, what it's actually depicting. This represents the power of the Spaniards, so the people from Spain that came in and conquest took over, represents the power of the Spaniards over the indigenous people. And this is offering protection given to the faithful. These are their soldiers. These will help protect them. All right, so this is a Catholic counter-reformation idea. They held militaristic ideology that portrayed the church as an army and angels as its soldiers. So here's an example of that. So we're seeing this now being brought over into Peru. All right, so we're going to talk about the style that this is painted in. This is painted before 1728. This is just considered 17th century, late 1600s, something around there. Um, but what here reminds you of mannerism? If you don't remember what mannerism is, this is our mannerism, manneristic painting that we looked at by uh, Pontormo called the entombment of Christ. Like they're either taking him off a cross, they're about to put him into the tomb. Maybe the tomb is like actually right below this painting. That's what we talked about with this painting. But stylized um, or stylization, what, what can you say is similar between the two in the form? Whoop, why'd that go away? 
All right, so the mannerism painting, by the way, is 1525. So this is just a comparison of years. Um, so they both have these elongated, kind of stretched out proportions, very graceful dance-like pose. Like if you look back at that manneristic painting, it's not really realistic that he would be able to be supporting Jesus's weight on his body while being on his toes, right? They all have these very delicate, dainty, pointed feet that are not realistic for the weight. Um, and they both have these elegant kind of dream-like expressions, right? He, he doesn't really look like he's about to aggressively fire this gun. He's kind of like daydreaming or dazing off. All right, also about the form, all of these angels are considered androgynous. Um, they're military, they're aristocratic, which means wealthy, upper class, and then celestial, which just means angels relating to the cosmos and the planets and the stars. Oh, and they're also inspired by these military prints. So there's just so much information. So I didn't say we had to write this, but they may have been inspired by these Dutch mannerist prints that were actually instructional prints on how to fire a gun. So we're gonna read about that. So here's another example of these prints that I'm talking about. So paintings of angels with guns were perhaps representative of both the power of the Spaniards over indigenous people and protection offered to the faithful Christians. Prints from the 1607 series, The Exercise of Arms by the Dutch mannerist engraver, Jacob D. Gien, may have inspired paintings such as Aziel Timor Day. These prints were models for specific military positions and they demonstrated how to fire a gun. However, the Andean paintings, our painting, differs from the prints since they combine local dress and do not present realistic military positions. The angel in Aziel Timur D holds the gun like a professional close to his chest. And although the gun is ready for firing, the angel does not hold the trigger, nor does he hold it at eye level, right? So he's not holding it like this. He's kind of has it perched, perched on his shoulder. Go back. Contrary to the aggressive face of this soldier, the face of our angel is serene. The figure is graceful and almost looks like a dancer. The extended lines of the angel's body recall the mannerist style still preferred in the Americas in the 17th century. Mannerism was a style that came after the Renaissance in the early 1500s. All right, next piece is very complicated, even more so than the last one. Screen with the siege of Belgrade and hunting scene. 1697 to 1701, so this is right around the same time. And the materials here are tempera, which is a type of paint, and then resin on wood. Uh, this is from the Khan Academy video. They say, this is one of the most complicated objects I have ever looked at. It's from Beth or Steve. All right, who remembers the Christopher Columbus poem they were taught in school? Do you remember it? Do you know it? Here's a little excerpt. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He had three chip, ships and left from Spain. He sailed through sunshine, wind, and rain. Isn't that lovely? So remember, he's not trying to find America. He's trying to find a different route to Asia to avoid the Ottoman control that's happening at the time. And then he discovered, right, the new world instead. So that's how he like accidentally landed there. So here he is coming from Spain, coming here, going there. All right, so after this discovery, they went to Asia, to the Philippines. And we've kind of been talking about what is the vice royalty of New Spain. And the vice royalty of New Spain also includes the Philippines because of this. So the vice, what we need to write down, the vice royalty of New Spain included much of North America, so everything that's green, North America, Mexico, Central America, and the Philippines. And then this began the Manila Galleon. This is a fleet of ships that tra was transporting goods from Asia, all the way over here, to Mexico, to Spain. So it was like, boop, boop, boop. That's the Manila Galleon. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Probably not. All right, so how can we see this influence in this artwork? That's the most important part about this piece. We need to be talking about the cultural um, references throughout it, and there's a lot. 
<coughs> Alright, overall, this is a folding screen. So objects like folding screens and lacquerware boxes are being imported, so <coughs> brought in from Asia. So here's an example of a folding screen that we have at the Nelson. Um, Biombos are folding screens that are specifically made in Mexico. So it's this Asian idea of a folding screen now being created in Mexico is the Biombos. I don't know if we need to write this, but Biombo is the Hispanization of Japanese Biobu, <coughs> meaning protection of the wind. Definitely don't need to write that, that's just extra. <coughs> How is the influence of Asian art evident here? Um, lacquerware boxes, here's the idea of lacquerware boxes. The border on the top of these, especially here on the left where you see these flowers. So the border on the top and the bottom is painted like a Japanese lacquerware box with flower motifs. So here's the lacquerware boxes. You see all these floral or flower motifs. And then here is what the top border looks like. All right, so this is happening at a time when there is a craze for Japanese goods. It's like a social status to have um, goods imported from Asia. Like, look how rich and wealthy I am, right? And that is exactly why Hobarth gave you these little Buddha figures, because he's commenting, he's making fun of this aristocratic um, fake lifestyle where there's supposed to be this upper class, but they have all these cheap knickknacks. They have a broken classical sculpture. Their life doesn't actually live up to what it's supposed to be. This sounds like a really awful term, Japanism. It's a term we're gonna hear again, and it's used to describe Europe's fascination with Asian goods. Again, having this Asian art and these Asian imported goods reflects a sophistication of aristocracy. All right, overall, this is made by a Mexican artist inspired by Japanese goods. This is made in Mexico by a Mexican artist inspired by Japanese goods. This is commissioned, right, paid for the Viceroy of Spain who is living in Mexico. Um, and then this, is, this was made for the palace in Mexico City. Here's the Viceroy, poor guy. All right, content, what is it actually depicting, right? Because we have to get more complicated here. So only half of the scene, this is only half of the scene of the Battle of Belgrade. The battle is depicting a fight between the Ottoman Turks and the Spanish Empire. So there's another reflection of culture. So the other half, there's one half that's in Mexico City and then the other half lives in the Brooklyn Museum. So what we are looking at is just a half of the whole overall um, screen. <clears throat> so that's our half that College Board has given us. Okay, so this is depicting a battle of the Ottoman Turks coming into Central Europe, and this is being made in Mexico, and this is inspired by Japanese goods. You got that? Okay, good. This is one of the most complicated objects Steve and Beth have ever seen. All right, so here's some detailed pictures or images of the battle that's happening, the Battle of Belgrade. So how would you describe the form? Well, there's a whole bunch of information about it. All right, so very delicate linear style of painting, right? Not a lot of modeling or chiaroscuro going on. Um, it's more linear. The areas that are illuminated, like you can see here, some shining reflection. Here's another vocabulary word. And there's only two artworks where we have this vocabulary word. This is called enconchado. So enconchado is inlaid shell. So you have this wood, right? And then you have shell being inlaid. You like niche out a piece of the wood, kind of carve it out and put shell in there. All right, so this is the only surviving example of a biombo and conchado, a screen with shell inlay. Um, it's a combination of oil painting with mother of pearl that's been placed into the screen, the only known surviving biombo and conchado. So the only time you'll ever have to use those vocabulary words together is with this piece. All right, so 
there's two different sides to the screen. The battle side was for the viceroy and important individuals. The different sides were intended for different audiences. So who do you think the other side was intended for and what is being depicted on that side? First of all, when you look at it, you can see nature, you can see these lovely ribbons, um, maybe a lot more flowers, a lot more floral. So this is going to be intended for, um, okay, for the women. So the opposite side is viewed by women. Overall function of the battle side is political use. It is expressing the viceroy's power, right? Who is the intended audience? This is at the palace. Um, the viceroy is seeing it. The important individuals that would be with the viceroy are seeing it. So that is showcasing his power. And then the women, this would have been the room where the viceroy's wife and friends would have gathered. So what's the leisurely scene that the women would be looking at? This is a beautiful landscape and hunting scene. Hunting is kind of like a leisurely activity that the upper aristocratic, upper wealthy class would be partaking in. Um, the form is a lot more relaxed. Oh, and then of course we have a lot of cultural influence happening here. So the imagery that is used for the hunting scene is influenced from a Medici tapestry. Medici is the wealthy family in Italy that was then copied onto a print and then since it's a print, prints can travel. There can be a lot of prints. So that print then traveled to Mexico, but it was originally made in France. So that is how the artist in Mexico was able to see this imagery. Oof. All right, the battle scene is also based from a print from Europe as well. All right, here's an art piece that I totally skipped over from the Northern Renaissance called um, Hunters in the Snow. This is by Peter Bruegel the Elder, but you can easily make some comparisons even just based on the form. So what does the, this scene on the screen have that is relating to Hunters in the Snow? They're both depicting hunting scenes so that you can relate them in content. And then the form, they're both depicting atmospheric perspective, which just means things looking farther um, it's depicting depth, right? You have trees really up close. They get smaller. They go higher up on the picture plane, right? Smaller, smaller, smaller. Everything's kind of fading away on the right where the space is receding. And you could see a similar depiction of form with the screen, the hunting scene screen, right? You have a tree large in the foreground. You have trees then getting smaller as they recede back into space. Um, things are getting less detailed, fuzzier in the background, more detailed in the foreground. Same thing here, more detailed in the foreground, less detailed in the background. This is atmospheric perspective where you're showing things receding in space, but you're not using your perspective lines. That's linear perspective. All right, there's more. So classical elements, um, swags at the top held in lion's mouths. That's what's painted. It's like these lion's mouths holding these ribbons. And you can see that in classical, which just means Greek or Roman art. This is very classical element that you see in the Renaissance, which is a rebirth of Greek and Roman art. All right, test questions. And then what you guys are gonna turn in. Turn in. Here's a previous test question. The formal quality of this work, The Angel with Archibus, shows that it was influenced by A, Byzantine art, Right, here's an example of Byzantine art and it's an extensive use of gold. B, Gothic art in its frontality. Here's a good example of the frontality in Gothic art. Well, he's not looking at you from the front, right? So I would say no. Um, there is gold, like there's gold being depicted on the fabric, which could be referenced to Byzantine. Um, mannerism in its awkwardness of poses or Rococo art in its lighthearted humor, which we haven't looked and talked about yet. And this is also about aristocracy and the upper, um, the upper class. But the best answer here we talked about is mannerism because of the awkwardness of pose and the weights not seeming realistic and the daintiness of the feet. Yeah. All right, here's what you guys are turning in for this assignment. Number one, fully identify both of these works of art. That means don't just write what you wrote down for the identifying information, actually put it into a sentence. So you could say, the work on the left is fill in the blank. The work on the right is fill in the blank, right? So you're formulating into a sentence. Number two, 
use two examples of specific contextual evidence, explain how both works demonstrate artistic exchange between the multiple cultures. How are these being influenced by different cultures? And you have to give two examples for each artwork. So I would break it into two different paragraphs, one paragraph for the artwork on the left, <coughs> one paragraph for the artwork on the right. If you're coming to class, we're going to be doing this together in class. Okay, and this is what you guys are turning in. Look forward to seeing your writing. Adios.